So hello gang, we've spent quite a few videos looking at the attempt by some of these giants in the late 1800s, early 1900s to incorporate quantum theory to explain atomic line spectra, photoelectric effect, all that fun stuff, right? Black body radiation. Thank you, Planck. Thank you, Einstein. Thank you, Bohr. But it wasn't quite complete when Bohr obviously applied it to electron motion. It worked for one electron species, hydrogen, and yeah, but he, he kind of transitioned it. So it wasn't until a little bit later um, that some newer ideas helped us improve the Bohr model. So there's two ideas I need to talk about. One by Louis de Broglie and one by Werner Heisenberg. So let's do one video each. Let's do Louis de Broglie first. So let's compare and contrast. So what did he have at work on? We know that in 1905, Einstein tried to explain, well, successfully explain, Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize, yay! Found a Nobel Prize in my Christmas stocking. Um, so he explained the photoelectric effect by proposing that light had particulate nature, i.e. The, the dreaded photon, fire photon torpedoes. So he said light had wave particle duality, right? There's situations where you treat it with the wave, with the known wave uh, you know, mechanics. And then sometimes you treat it like a particle when it strikes an electron, transfers momentum, boop, photoelectric effect, right? Well, 1924, I think he was a graduate student at the time, little booger, right? Louis de Broglie, he goes, well, I don't know his thinking process, but imagine you're having lunch, you're like, well, if light can have wave and particle duality, why can't particles have wave and particle duality too? So he proposed it. You know, didn't prove it. He just proposed it and says, hey, if light can be a particle and a wave, why can't a particle be a particle and a wave? Oh, okay. So he just proposed that small particles could have wave-like behavior. And I'm like, what? That was, that was weird. Need to watch some Monty Python, man. Have some weird orange juice. Um, so he proposed the wave-particle duality of matter. It took a few years later to prove he was right. Nobel Prize! Nobel Prize for everybody! <laughs> so many Nobel Prizes during this time period. To be a physicist in the early 1900s. What a time to be a thinker. Oh my God. So let's take a look at how this proposal um, and some of the mathematics to it. it. It's follow with it. You might just go, man, it's just not fair, is it? Are you ready to do a derivation? All right. So here's where De Broglie started. I'm going to kind of skip a little part of it and simplify it for you. All right. So De Broglie went, oh, okay, you know, we're all, we all know Einstein's famous for his E equals MC squared, right? And we also know Planck's energy, Right? So energy is Planck's constant times frequency, or hc over lambda. All right, well, let's write those down. Let's try. So we know E equals mc squared. Right? That was from Einstein. And we know E equals hc over lambda. That was from Planck, or h nu. So let's call this from Planck. And this is from Einstein. And we unfortunately don't have time to dig into the details of that one. Well, would you agree that if this equals E and that equals E, then that must equal that? Oh, if A equals B and B equals C, then A must equal C. Ooh, there's a name for that. I've forgotten. So MC, MC Hammer. So mc squared equals hc over lambda. So what we're after is the wavelength. If a particle, ha if a particle has wave-like behavior, what's the wavelength of the particle? It's weird to think about. It's really weird to think about. Notice there are c's on both sides. That's going to cancel. Let's isolate the wavelength. So wavelength will be hc over mc squared. Right? Just move the wavelength over, multiply through by wavelength, divide through by mc squared, you're good to go. Let's cancel out one of the c's, is h over mc. Now, obviously, that's the speed of light. I know if I chuck a baseball, it's not going the speed of light. I'd be lucky with my bum shoulder to be able to push 50 miles an hour right now. How do those people, how does Nolan Ryan chuck a 100-plus mile per hour baseball? You ever, you ever sat in a batter's box and watched a hundred, you know, not, I'm not going to say hit a hundred mile an hour fastball, just watch one go by. 
right? You just it'd be that'd be a fun calculation to do if you're bored on a date or something. Say, hmm, what's the distance between the pitcher's mound and the catcher's mitt, or technically your where your bat swing is going to be right over the plate? And if Nolan Ryan is throwing, say, 100, 405 miles per hour or something like that, how long would it take for that ball to leave Nolan Ryan's hand and cross the plate? How much time would you have? You're up there and you see the pitch coming. How much time? And you got it takes time to swing, too. So literally, how much time do you have to think about, should I swing or not swing? And if that ball is like a curveball, go, oh, my God, you would just stand there and just go, boom, boom. Somebody threw something. I heard it hit the mitt, but I didn't see it. Oh, my gosh. There was a cool video I saw. Um, it looked at who was the fastest pitcher in history. Because it's hard. They, you know, obviously didn't start recording until more recently. They weren't recording Babe Ruth's speed. Um, so they were trying to retroactively calculate the speed of some of the older pitchers and see, well, hey, who really had the fastest pitch ever? And is there a physical limit? I was, okay, I went off on a rabbit trail. Here we go. <laughs> so what we're going to do for particles, obviously they're not moving the speed of light. Let's let C equal the velocity U, right? Remember we used that term U for velocity? This is a pretty simple derivation, isn't it? So let's stick in the velocity instead of the speed of light. Therefore, we get de Broglie's equation. They always name it after themselves. I would do. The wavelength of a particle, what a weird concept, will be Planck's constant over the mass of the particle times the velocity of the particle. Hey! Now watch out, Planck's constant uses joules. So if you're looking for a wavelength, you gotta use that kilograms meters squared per second squared. We'll do a calculation, I'll show you how to substitute that in. Which means particles, and he was mostly talking about small particles, you know, electrons, things like that. Because um, we'll find out if you apply it to really big objects, like, you know, like cars, and, you know, beach balls and things like that. The mass is so big, the wavelength's so tiny, it's it's just irrelevant, right? So if I get up and start walking, la da 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 I actually have a wavelength. I have a mass, I have a velocity. My mass is getting bigger because the gyms are closed. My velocity is getting slower because I'm getting older and I'm in more pain. But I got I have a wavelength. What is Dr. Lux's wavelength? It's it's teeny tiny and irrelevant. You won't be able to see it. But if you've got small particles, right, with really tiny masses, hey, those wavelengths start becoming maybe even atomic or nuclear dimensions, which means they may, wait a minute, if you strike a wave, to strike a wave, if, the, if this particle is really truly moving as a wave, if you strike a, wa strike a wave onto something with spacings of roughly the same you know, wavelength as that wave, you get diffraction. So this could easily be tested, right? Easily, easily be tested. Take electrons, maybe make an electron beam or something, pew, 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 an electron machine gun. And if that wavelength really is atomic dimensions, we could take like a solid crystal with atoms with distinct spacings between them, strike it with an electron beam, and we technically should get a diffraction pattern if electrons truly move as waves. Oh, see that? As long as the wavelength of the electrons is, you know, roughly approaching the interatomic uh, dimensions. So the same as you would do like if you hit it with x-rays. X-rays have wavelengths right around those dimensions. So those x-rays cause a diffraction pattern and you could actually get the spacings. We'll do that next semester. You can calculate the spacing between the nuclei and get atomic radius from x-ray diffraction patterns. It's really cool. Thank you, Lowy. So let's do a calculation with this and see what we get, right? Just watch out, the math is easy. The units will mess you up if you don't track them. All right, let's do a problem. And we could, we could do a baseball, a person, aircraft carrier, planet, whatever you want to do. But it really only works with very, very small particles. That was the intention, because otherwise the wavelengths are too tiny. So what's the wavelength of, say, some electrons? Let's say we have an electron beam. Um, and let's say those electrons are moving at, say, 5% the speed of light, just for kicks and giggles. Um, 
what's its wavelength? What's the, what is the wavelength? Let's see if that approaches uh, you know nuclear dimensions or atomic dimensions. Uh, and you can look up the math. I'd give this to you on a test. I don't expect you to memorize this, but you can look this up in tables. It's one of the uh, probably in the video on subatomic particles. I can't remember if I gave you the absolute mass or the. I think I gave you the relative mass. So you'd probably have to look this one up in a textbook or something. So let's call the mass of an electron nine point one zero nine times ten to the minus thirty one kilograms. Electrons are pretty light. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's go. So a couple things real quick. First, let's get that speed, the velocity, technically, right? So let's get the velocity. Will be five percent. So what's that? 0 0.05 times the speed of light, two point nine nine seven nine two five times ten to the eighth. I think I got the speed of light memorized there. So let's punch that out. Let's get our trusty. I haven't calculated this. So let's take 0 0.05. That's 5%, right? Times 2.997925 times 10 to the 8th. It's still a big number. Let's put that in scientific notation. And we got, that's exact. So we got lots of sig figs. So let's just write out all the digits. So 1.49. Eight nine six two five times ten to the one two three four five six seven meters per second. So that would be the speed of the electrons. We could probably do that in the calculation as well. All right. So what I want you to do is take um, the, the De Broglie equation, uh, and remember from the De Broglie equation, the wavelength of the particle. It's Planck's constant over the mass times the velocity. So look up Planck's constant. I gave you the mass. We've got the velocity. Track the units. And remember, a joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared, right? So if my mass wasn't in kilograms, I'd have to convert to kilograms, right? Let's see how we do it. This will You'll end up with meters. You probably get a small number. You probably want to convert that to nanometers or picometers just to see. Give it a shot. Um, I think I might need to erase this and put it on the next board. Fun calculations. You ready? So here's the De Broglie equation. So the wavelength of the particles, Planck's constant divided by the mass, divided by the velocity, right? We're replacing the speed of light with the velocity of the particle. And this is moving along at a good pace, 5% the speed of light, so it's trucking. So there's uh, Planck's constant, got it memorized, 6.62607 times 10 to minus 34 joules times second, divided by the mass of the electron provided for you, 9.109 times 10 to minus 31st kilograms. And look at that, you see the joules, it gets all messed up and stuff. So what I'm going to do is replace joules with its IUPAC or SI, not IUPAC, but SI units. So a joule is a kilograms times meter squared per second squared. So see the seconds as a minus two. So really the second squared would be in the denominator, but that would look weird. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the joules. Let's do this in blue. Canceling the joules. So now I can see the kilograms and stuff. See how the kilograms cancel? Okay, so I get meter squared on top per second squared. Dun, 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 dun. And we've got one meter here and two meters there. So that meter cancels, the squared cancels. I've got a second in the numerator here. I've got a second in the numerator there. And these seconds are, see, they're the negative two. They're actually in the denominator. So second squared on top, second squared on bottom, and I'm left with meters. Woo! Those are some gnarly units, my friends. I had to stop and think about that for a second because the seconds are split. There's a second here on top and a second over here on top. To give me second squared on top, cancels the, cancels the second squared on the new, in the denominator. So make sure you do the joule conversion there. Or instead of writing joules, you can just put kilograms meter squared per second squared in there already. All right, well, I got four sig figs here. So I get 4.85282 times 10 minus 11th meters. Good to four sig figs. And I don't know what that is in you know, meters. Trying to think, is that nuclear dimensions, atomic dimensions? So I converted that to picometers. 
right? Because uh, what was the Bohr radius? Like 53 picometers or something like that? So that, that first electron orbit was about 53 picometers. And if you look at atomic radii, right, they're in the 100 to 200, you know, somewhere picometer range. So it's in the picometer range. So there's 1 trillion picometers per meter or 1 times 10 to the 12. So I just converted that. And I get 48.5282 picometers. Round that to four sig figs, rounds up 48.53 picometers. Well, that's that's very, very close to the Bohr radius, right? So we're, we're there in nuclear dimensions, atomic dimensions, which means if I have an electron, theoretically, if you take an electron beam and strike a solid surface, right, with, uh, with atoms that are within the, the picometer range, 100 picometers, somewhere in that range, Technically, these particles should undergo diffraction, which is a wave property. Anything that undergoes interference or diffraction or refraction is a wave. It is a wave, right? So wouldn't it be interesting? Wouldn't you be tempted as an experimentalist if De Broglie proposed this? You'd be like, hmm, that seems like a pretty easy experiment. Somehow I got to create some, something that shoots an electron beam, so I'd have to figure that out shoot it on some metal and see if I get a diffraction pattern. A lot like if you shot x-rays at it and got a diffraction pattern. Would they look similar? Would you even, one, get a diffraction pattern, right? The electrons diffract off, undergo interference, the waves interfere, you get a, you know, constructive, destructive interference and thus a diffraction pattern. I wonder if it would look like an x-ray diffraction pattern. Wouldn't that be interesting? Wouldn't it be neat to be the first person to do that? See the, the drool? That's Nobel Prize worthy drool. Because <laughs> remember, Nobel Prize is for everybody. I wonder if somebody did that. Let's see on the next board. Gosh, what do you think? All right. Remember, these experimentalists are slobbering at the mouse here. Scientific method, right? Observation, hypothesis. So in this one, we're starting with a hypothesis that, you know, electrons or small particles have wave behavior. So the experimentalists go, woo, let's set up some experiments, baby. So 1927, two critical experiments, Davison and Germer. We got a couple different research groups. And this is how science works. They confirm each other's stuff. Hopefully they both get credit for it, but not always. Davison and Germer took a nickel surface, shot electron beams at it, and showed that the electrons underwent diffraction. <gasps> oh, only waves undergo diffraction, right? So the electrons must be waves. Interesting, because we showed the wavelength of the electrons moving at, at you know, some percentage of the speed of light is roughly the, you know, Bohr radius, pretty close, right? Or close to the nickel-nickel, uh, you know, distances between two nickel atoms. Uh, G.P. Thompson, seen that name before? The son of J.J. Thompson. Ha, 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 ha. Remember 1897-ish? J.J. Thompson um, you know, was the first one to uh, get those uh, electrons from, from the cathode ray tubes and show that the electrons were subatomic particles. Yeah. Apparently the son followed the father into the brainiac science mode. Well, he actually compared and contrasted off of a metal foil an X-ray diffraction pattern and an electron diffraction pattern. And they look very, very similar. You can look those up if you want to. I'm not going to draw those on the board. I'm not going to draw diffraction patterns on the board. But they look very similar to each other. So more proof that electrons had wave behavior. So they both confirmed de Broglie's you know, proposal that matter had waves. There's matter waves. Wave particle duality of matter. Crazy. So... This, this shows one of the flaws in the Bohr's model of the atom, where he treated electrons as point particles moving in circles. No, 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 that can't be right, because the electrons actually move like waves. Interesting. How do we incorporate that one into improving the Bohr model? Ooh, it's going to take some really smart people to do that. And one more proposal. We've got Heisenberg coming up. So uh, G, uh, Thompson got the Nobel Prize. I mean, J.J. Thompson, obviously, with his work on the electron. But his son also got a Nobel Prize with, uh, with, the, with one of these guys. I can't remember which one. So both the father and the son got Nobel Prizes. That's pretty cool, right? Uh, and now what's kind of funny is the father, J.J. Thompson, got a Nobel Prize for showing that electrons were particles. And his son got a Nobel Prize for showing electrons were waves. So, oh, go get that one. <laughs> you got to love it. Great stuff. All right, let's look at Heisenberg and his infamous uncertainty principle. Yeah.